six weeks, five murders, one killer. You can imagine my reaction and, uh, and that of the force. You know, good grief, what's going on here? What's happening? An entire town terrorised. Going out there, like, thinking, oh, is it my turn tonight? Am I not going to come home tonight? And a police force under media siege. I will, I will need you at some point to go. We had the world's media camped out on the, the front lawn. I'd certainly not experienced that kind of pressure before. Tonight, the inside story of the hunt for the Suffolk Strangler, the serial killer who devastated five families. I wish we still had the death penalty, as this is what he truly deserves. And tore his own family apart. The thing is, the whole thing can never be put right. October 2006, and on a few isolated back streets in Ipswich, up to 30 young women ply their trade to curb crawlers. One of these was 19-year-old Tanya Nickel. She had been working the streets for more than a year, and on the night of October the 30th, she left home around 11 to begin touting for business. But on this night, Tanya failed to return home. 24 hours later, her mother, unaware of her daughter's prostitution, reported her missing. This is 19-year-old Tanya Nicol. She's been missing for over a week. Police are extremely concerned for her welfare because of her lifestyle. It's not uncommon for people to go missing. More than 200,000 cases are reported every year. But in this instance, alarm bells began ringing almost immediately. We knew Tanya was a prostitute. We knew she was a working girl. So she's already sort of regarded as high risk. She's working in a, in a high risk industry. She's vulnerable. On her regular schedule, we would know that she was around. She would contact somebody. Um, when she didn't, we knew that actually we were dealing with quite a serious case. Because of these fears, the police decided to make a public appeal in the hope that someone somewhere knew where Tanya was. Unfortunately, the investigation so far, we haven't managed to locate her on any of the buses she may have caught into town, and we haven't located her on any available CCTV to date. A worried mother waits for news of her daughter. Anyone who can help should call Suffolk Police or Crime Stoppers. Tanya Nichols' disappearance may have made news in Ipswich, but the story barely registered on the radar of any newspaper or TV station outside of Suffolk. But that would soon change because just a fortnight later, another woman would go missing in exactly the same circumstances. Gemma Adams was just 25 years old. She had been working the streets for two years, but after going out on the night of November the 14th, she hadn't been seen again. Well, I started to get worried because she wasn't replying to my text messages. So, and Gemma always replies to me and she didn't. Like Tanya Nickel, Gemma always kept in regular phone contact with friends to tell them about her whereabouts. But now those calls had stopped. For the Suffolk police, this was an ominous sign. Soon they were stepping up their efforts to find both women. We distributed some 20,000 leaflets around the area. We set up road checks um, at periodic times after the, uh, the disappearances, and we interviewed some 400 uh, people in respect of um, Tanya's disappearance and some 300 in respect of Gemma's disappearance. But the leafleting campaign produced no leads, and police became increasingly pessimistic about finding either of the women alive. Along with their appeals for sightings, they began looking for bodies. Two weeks later, they found one. By the side of a dark and isolated brook, a passerby came across the remains of Gemma Adams. The body was found in the water just a few hundred metres down this path. Police have now sectioned off a wide area and are investigating the scene. When Gemma was found, I think we, we went into shock. We all thought that, OK, we had two women that were missing, but we were confident that we were going to find them. And that's when it sort of started to hit home that we were dealing with a murder case then. 
With one prostitute dead and another missing, local reporters descended on the red light district. There they found girls who were frightened to work, but still unwilling to give up. Going out there, like, thinking, oh, is it my turn tonight? Am I not going to come home tonight? Do you know what I mean? But what choice have I got but to go out there, like, so, like, you're in a dilemma. Like, if you don't go out there, you're going to be ill. If you do go out there, then you're going to be terrified. All, all the women had a Class A drugs habit, so the reason they were going out was to feed that habit. They weren't going out for fun, <laughs> you know, or because they thought, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll pop out and do a bit of work and then c I'll come back again. Actually, they needed that. They were being drawn by that addiction. Cards would go by and you'd be praying that they would pick you up to get money, but you'd be praying that they wouldn't because you wouldn't, don't want them to do what they're going to do. After finding the first body, the police extended their search for Tanya. And six days later, they found her. Like Gemma, she was discovered in Belstead Brook. And like Gemma, she'd been murdered. Discreetly shielded by a line of police officers in their vehicles, the body of a young woman is recovered from a brook in the countryside just outside Ipswich. For the second time in less than a week, the grim sight of an ambulance taking away a dead girl whose naked body had somehow ended up in a stream. This probably wasn't the deposition site. It wasn't where she'd entered the water. There had been significant flooding during October and November of 2006, and she'd probably been carried in the flow of the water to Copdock, and she'd got caught up in some shrubbery. Suffolk Constabulary, which dealt with an average of six murders in an entire year, now had two in the space of six days. Whoever was responsible seemed to be picking out girls at random from Ipswich's red light district. Why, why well, have you decided to come out tonight? Because I need the money. I need the money, you know. Despite the dangers? Well, that has made me a bit wary about getting into cars, you know. But presumably you, you will do that tonight? Well, probably. This was 24-year-old Paula Clonell. She would not live to see Christmas. In December 2006, the sleepy county of Suffolk had become the scene of one of Britain's biggest investigations. Two women had been found dead after going missing on the streets of Ipswich. And although their bodies were both discovered in the same river, detectives were unable to establish a definite link. The bodies of Tanya Nicholl and Gemma Adams were found in fast-flowing, uh, very, very uh, cold water. And the problem that presented from our perspective was uh, because of the immersion in water, any trace evidence that was present was likely to have been uh, destroyed or washed away. But if there was any doubt that the deaths were linked, it was soon to be removed. Despite a high police presence on the streets, Suffolk Constabulary were getting more reports of women disappearing. And just days after the second body was found, a third was also discovered. This time, the victim was 24-year-old Annalee Alderton, and like the others, she had been working as a prostitute. Once uh, Annalee uh, Alderton's body had been found, then clearly we were into a different realm, uh, and it looked at that stage very much that we'd got uh, a, a serial killer on our hands. We'd clearly got very, very obviously linked uh, murder investigations in a very close area around Ipswich uh, and all the indications at that stage was it was the, it was the work of um, one man uh, or a man or, or men working together uh, in, in um, sort of a spree of killing. Because Annalee's body was found on dry land, the police felt they had a better chance of finding useful evidence. Head of crime scenes David Stagg was given overall responsibility for recovering it. As you can see, the site where the body was deposited is literally 15, 20 yards away from the road in a, a little bit of a clearing. This is pretty much as it was at the time with, um, with the foliage. Um, the body itself was actually laid out in a, in a cruciform position, which was quite disturbing for the people who actually found the, the body. But of course, the weather at the time was absolutely appalling, and that presented a big problem for the scenes of crime officers who came here, because priority number one was all about scene preservation. The opportunities for DNA evidence and fibre evidence will be washed away unless we got the tent over the body as soon as possible. As the forensic officers got to work, the investigation team came to terms with the new enormity of the case. A small force like Suffolk was ill-equipped to deal with a serial killer. 
there probably wasn't an hour went past where I wasn't thinking how many more, what else are we going to find, because it was just escalating at such a, uh, such a rate. What we lacked were the staff, the, the numbers of police officers and police staff to actually assist us to put in place all of the different things we needed to do. Of the 43 police forces in England and Wales, 40 sent help. More than 100 members of the Forensic Science Service were also drafted in. David Stagg and his team were under pressure to find clues pointing to Annalise Killer, but it was proving difficult. As you can see by the undergrowth that's here, it can be difficult to establish who has been where within the scene. Um, footprints aren't left very readily on this type of ground, apart from um, some of the foliage being trampled down. Um, it is quite difficult to determine if a body's been lying here for sort of five days exactly where the point of access was and we did have difficulties with that with this particular scene. Meanwhile, detectives began piecing together Annalie's last known movement. They discovered that she had travelled by train from Harwich to work in Ipswich's red light district on the night she disappeared. We got some CCTV footage of her travelling on the train and on the platform at uh, Manning Tree before actually travelling on to Ipswich. We established that she'd, she'd visited her, her mother before leaving Essex. She was actually looking to raise money in order to buy Christmas presents. But there was something more significant about these CCTV images. The date on the film showed they were captured on December the 3rd, the day after the first body, that of Gemma Adams, was found. That meant the killer was not only on the loose, he was also operating right under the noses of the police that he continued to, to prey on these women was incredibly audacious, incredibly audacious, very risky as well. Um, the police very quickly, um, as you'd expect, targeted the red light district. They, they had a very visible presence there. One slip up, one foul move, and he would have been caught red-handed. And there were people who were saying, well, how can this possibly happen? You know, we've got the CCTV cameras, there's plenty of officers around the streets. It wasn't just the public who were asking those questions, the media were too. They were descending on Suffolk in force, and as the number of victims grew, so did the amount of cameras. We confirmed the recovery of a third body with the media on that Sunday evening, so we knew what to expect the following day. It was pretty overwhelming, and it continued to build throughout, throughout the course of that week. The interest in the story suddenly um, mushroomed, really. It became enormous overnight. Can you kind of clarify, there's 98 of the 12, thank you. Yeah. One of the smallest forces in the country is now dealing with an unprecedented killing spree. You can imagine my reaction and, uh, and that of the force, you know, good grief, what's going on here, what's happening. This just doesn't happen in Suffolk. On average, we get about six or seven murders a year uh, here in Suffolk. Well, we now had three during, you know, a relatively short period of time. Little did I know, of course, what was to come. What did come, and very quickly, was news of yet more prostitutes disappearing. Annette Nichols was one of two women to go missing during the following days. The other was Paula Clonell, who had given a TV interview on the streets of Ipswich less than a week before. I'm hoping for the best. I'm hoping that she is with friends or something, you know, she's done something wrong. I don't know, you know, she... All she has to do, really, is just contact her mother or the confidential police line and she'll get all the help she wants. I saw Paula, like, um, a couple of hours before she went out that night and I'm like, well, make sure you look after yourself of all these people. And she's like, don't worry, I'll just stay, like, near on these streets so I'll be safe, like, I'll be, so I'll be seen and that. But then she didn't come back the next day. That next day, December the 12th, police were examining the wooded area where the third victim, Annalee Alderton, had been found. It was while searching for fresh clues that they stumbled across a fourth body. And obviously we had a, a lot of media interest down at this scene, so of course when the, the news was released that a, another body had been found, the press were actually on the scene right away and they were actually filming as the cordons were being put up. It's literally just um, a few hundred yards away as the crow flies. The fourth victim was identified as Paula Clonell. I will, I will need you at some point to go, all right? When Paula's body was discovered, uh, we deployed the force helicopter to overfly the area and, and photographically capture the scenes. And you can see the live images. And we can see the uh, first body 
what transpired to be Paula. And it appears that Paula had just been dumped, she had just been dumped probably about eight or ten metres in from the road into fairly deep undergrowth. And we, we looked away, I think, to speak to the inspector. Turned back and, and saw a body on the screen, which actually was laying in a different position. Didn't think too much of it at that time. It really sort of just was carrying on organising things. And, of course, reality then kicks in, and we realise that, actually, the air support unit have found a second body. And it was, you know, it was a horrible double take, and then a realisation that, actually, we've got a fifth victim there, and, and, and that was a, you know, a real spine-chilling moment. Victim number five was identified as 29-year-old Annette Nichols. A police press conference later revealed another ghastly twist in this tale. At 3.48 p.m., a crew member on board the helicopter spotted what appeared to be a second body a few hundred yards away from the site of the first body. As you will understand, we don't have a great deal of information, as the Chief Constable has just indicated. This is breaking news, and we're giving it to you as we get it. In less than a fortnight, the police had now discovered five bodies. Gemma Adams, Tanya Nicholl, Annalee Alderton, Paula Clennell, and Annette Nichols. All prostitutes, all working the same few streets. It just took the whole community I think it took the world by surprise. I don't think anybody expected it. Five bodies in 10 days in similar circumstances, you know, what was happening here. And I, I think that's what captivated um, the imagination of uh, not just the local community, but, but the world. I'm not walking in the places that I'd usually walk in. Um, I know the village quite well, and <laughs> it's really quite shocking. I think we're all, you know, in deep, deep shock, really. The way we all feel. I feel sick. I woke up with a headache this morning, to be honest. It's awful. Ipswich is quite a small, insular community, really, and um, I think there are a lot of people in the town who had some kind of connection to the girls that were going missing or had been killed, um, whether it be through a friend or through a relative. It was a, it was a pretty frightening time to be in the town. So frightening, it even began to affect the town's commercial life. For many, the simple daily routine of travelling to and from work had become a nightmare. The effect on everybody, but the, but the female staff in particular, was massive. And we work shifts here, so lots of girls have to walk home in the dark or walk to the bus in the dark or walk to their car in the dark. And a lot of their cars are parked not very far from where um, these unfortunate girls operated. So they were scared. In the midst of the frenzy, a national newspaper offered a quarter of a million pounds reward for information leading to the killer. But the story was making headlines far beyond Britain. We had the world's media camped out on the, the front lawn here at police headquarters. I'd certainly not experienced that kind of pressure before. Um, I don't think any of us had. Um, in fact, I don't think many of our colleagues around, uh, around the country uh, have. Uh, because of the, the unique nature of these crimes and because of the speed with which they were occurring, uh, it was just uh, you know, a unique set of circumstances. But for all the international interest, this remained a small-town tragedy. On December the 16th, Ipswich came together to remember its dead. In silence, we remember the five women who died. We remember Gemma, Annette, Paula, Tanya, and Nelly. Understandably, I suspect the community were looking in, thinking, you know, what's happening? What's happening here in our county? Um, what's taking place? Are the Suffolk Constabulary going to bring a stop to these events unfolding? Are they going to find the person or persons responsible as quickly as possible? And of course, at that particular time, I didn't have the answers to those questions. In an effort to speed progress, detectives asked the families of the victims to help them. The parents of the first victim, Tanya Nicholl, agreed to make a televised appeal for information. Tanya has been taken by someone who needs to be found. We ask for anyone who knows this person or persons to come forward and contact the police. The appeal and the relentless media coverage led to a huge amount of calls from the public. 
Despite the force already being overstretched, every one of them needed to be checked out. Just during that middle week of December, we, we received something like in excess of 12,000 telephone calls. I needed to reassure myself that there were no sort of golden nuggets of information amongst that volume of calls. One name that came up repeatedly during those calls was Tom Stevens. The 37-year-old supermarket worker knew many of the prostitutes operating in Ipswich and had made himself available for interviews with journalists covering the story. Although he denied involvement in the murders, in one interview he had hinted that he could have been the killer. He was an individual who knew um, all of the girls, I think it was, um, had associated with them had a propensity to spend an awful lot of time in the red light district. So he was of interest to us. He was just really weird and nosy and wanted to know everything about you and that. And, like, I just thought it was, like, really creepy and everything and, like, give, like, girls a lift to go and get their stuff and everything like that. He'd been quite engaging with the media and the police throughout, throughout this period, almost drawing attention to himself. In custody and helping police with their inquiries, the man who lived here is being held by police hunting the Suffolk serial killer. Detectives investigating the murder of five women in Ipswich area have today, Monday the 18th of December 2006, arrested a man. But if the police were to charge their suspect, they would need more than just circumstantial evidence. They ordered the forensic team to examine three of the prostitutes' bodies looking for traces of DNA from their attacker. If it matched that of Tom Stevens, they would have their serial killer. Given the seriousness of, of, of this investigation and, and the time pressure the, the police were under and ourselves, we managed to turn the, the analysis round an unprecedented time of eight hours, uh, which is pretty much unheard of in any investigation of that type. And despite our low expectation of finding anything, a, a full DNA profile was obtained. We've got a DNA profile, not of just one of the victims, but all three, and it was the same man. But the DNA did not match that of their suspect. Tom Stevens was in the clear. The killer was still at large. Despite the thousands of calls from the public and the help from police forces nationwide, detectives in Suffolk were still trying to catch up with the serial killer who had murdered five prostitutes in Ipswich. DNA recovered from the bodies of three of the victims didn't match that of their prime suspect and had been released without charge. But those DNA tests had given detectives a full genetic profile of the attacker. And when this was fed into the national database, they found it matched that of another man, 48-year-old Steve Wright. Steve Wright had been arrested and charged with a fairly minor offence uh, some years previously at Felixstowe. I think it was a, uh, an offence of theft. And as is the case now with anybody that's charged with an offence, we take a DNA swab from them and um, his DNA profile was on the uh, national DNA database. So it seemed a moment of greed from Steve Wright's past had caught up with him, bringing to an end one of the most spectacular killing sprees of modern times. While the murders were happening, police had flooded Ipswich's red light district. They had no idea the man they were hunting lived at the very centre of it, number 79, London Road. We knew he was a, a regular curb crawler. He had been stopped on a couple of occasions. He had actually passed through a road check in respect of Tanya Nicol, and he answered some uh, questions to a questionnaire that were put to him. So he was already in the system, but it would be fair to say he wasn't high on our radar. Steve Wright only moved to London Road, uh, which is in the heart of Ipswich's red light district, um, a matter of weeks before the first uh, girl, Tanya Nicol, went missing. Uh, he moved directly into the red light district with his partner, um, Pam Wright. On the five nights that these young women were abducted and probably murdered. She was working nights, so, you know, he, he had a free reign. There was nobody at home. He could come and go as he pleased. This time it was a quiet street in Ipswich's red light district. 
Police arrived before dawn to make a second arrest in two days. The 48-year-old man was arrested at his home address in Ipswich at approximately 5 a.m. this morning, Tuesday, the 19th of December, 2006. He has been arrested on suspicion of murdering all five women. The people of Ipswich may have greeted the news with relief, but Wright's father, Conrad, greeted it with incomprehension. When the murders first came out, I was watching the television sort of regularly, and uh, they did make an arrest, and uh, I just didn't think that much more about it and thought they had the man in question. And then they decided that they'd found another man, a 48-year-old man from Ipswich, where my son I knew lived, but I didn't know exactly where, and it turned out to be him. And I couldn't believe it anyway, and I still don't. Following the arrest, detectives brought Wright in for questioning. But despite the weight of the evidence against him, he was in no mood to confess. We've got the last girl to go missing with your DNA and the one before with your DNA. Both on their naked bodies. How can that be? No comment. With Wright refusing to cooperate, officers knew this would be no quick and easy case to wrap up. I think the public's perception is, well, that's it, you know, the police have got their man, you know, it's cracked. That's clearly not the case. Everybody's entitled to their day in court and their trial. And that's when the hard work begins for us. Police couldn't rely purely on DNA um, because Steve Wright was known to use prostitutes. Um, and it was quite clear that uh, his defence would be that, yeah, my DNA was on these women because I've slept with them, I've paid for sex with them. Um, it was therefore the police challenge to build this catalogue of evidence against him. Part of that additional evidence would concern Wright's movements on the nights the women went missing. Officers scoured 10,000 hours of CCTV in an attempt to find images of them as well as their suspected killer. Their first positive sighting was of Annette Nichols in Ipswich three days before she disappeared and captured on film, probably for the last time. We subsequently recovered a piece of footage which again was particularly poor and grainy but we believed to be Gemma during the early hours of the 14th of November but that didn't necessarily take us any further forward. Tanya Nichols' mother, Kerry, later confirmed this to be her daughter. The police now had film of four of the victims shortly before their deaths but what they really needed was proof of Steve Wright's blue Mondeo car being in those same areas on those same nights. Once again, they called on surveillance technology. Steve Wright's vehicle, or what we believe to be Steve Wright's vehicle, was seen in various parts of, of the town. Um, we were able to map all of that um, and, and also use that in conjunction with the automatic number plate reader cameras, which are situated in the town. What that actually meant was it could time and date when vehicles were being used in that location. And Steve Wright's vehicle was seen very... Um, at uh, very important times on two of the nights, if you like, that um, girls went missing. Taken on the night it all began, October the 30th, this is believed to be the final image of Tanya Nickel, the first victim. Around midnight, Wright's Mondeo pulls up and Tanya gets in. She was never seen again. As important as it was, and how it, you know, uh, in the sense that it did confirm that the police were probably onto the right man, it still wasn't enough, it wasn't going to convict him. There was still a lot more work to do. Much of that work would be carried out by the forensics team. They'd found Wright's DNA on three of the victims, but could they find anything incriminating on the bodies of Tanya Nickel and Gemma Adams? These first two victims had been dumped in a river, and examining them would be difficult. Because of the environment in which Tanya and Gemma had been deposited, we felt the best opportunity that presented itself for any evidence recovery would have been their hair. When we looked at the hair samples from each of these women, we found something in the order of two kilograms of silt vegetation contamination in each. So really our first task was to try and separate that contamination out from the hair samples themselves. After several weeks of recovery process, searching and finally comparison, one of the most significant findings that we obtained uh, from the debris recovered from Tanya's hair was a black nylon fiber. Now these fibers are very, very typical of those that you find in the construction of carpets. And of course, the first thing that came to mind was his car. 
With that in mind, we went to his car, obtained some samples, and we found a match between this nylon fiber in Tanya's hair with the carpet with inside his vehicle. The conclusion we drew from that was that this fibre had been transferred by a, a fairly forceful and sustained contact between Tanya's head and the car carpet. The DNA on the victim's bodies, the film of right with one of the victims on the night she disappeared, and this new forensic evidence meant the police were now confident of bringing murder charges. But waiting on remand in prison, Wright was still claiming innocence, even to his father. I had a letter from the prison to say that I'd been put on a visiting list by Steve, <clears throat> and I made an appointment, and I went, and uh, went through the uh, uh, arrivals, uh, and uh, then he declined to see me. <clears throat> so I come away not having seen him. I wrote him a letter, and he wrote me one back. My head seems to be all over the place at the moment, so please try and sort this out. You say you want to help, so please do that one thing for me, but I don't know what he means. He never, you know, explained. Wright's letter hinted at an unhappy childhood, something his father disputes. Whenever I get upset, I tend to bury it deep inside which I suppose is not a healthy thing to do because the more I do that, the more withdrawn I become because I have seen so much anger and violence in my childhood to last anyone a lifetime. Now, I've tried to find out what this violence and anger is, but I just don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. On the 14th of January 2008, Wright went on trial charged with murdering all five women. Any hopes that he'd buckle under the weight of evidence soon came to an end. Not guilty. He maintained his innocence throughout. By the time Wright took to the stand, we'd, uh, we were several weeks into the trial. Suddenly, you know, the tension rose and, um, and it became incredibly interesting, of course, um, to hear what he had, he had to say for himself. It was the first time any of us had, had even heard him utter a word. There are a number of coincidences in this case, are there not, Mr. Wright? Are there not? It would seem so, yes. Well, let us consider just a few of them, shall we? There were 57 different coincidences which were put to him, um, and to everyone he gave pretty much the same answer, which was, it would seem so, yes. Shall we start with your DNA? That is another coincidence, is it not? It would seem so, yes because it would seem that your full profile is on the bodies of the three women who were recovered from dry land. Is that a coincidence? It seems so, yes. It seemed to me that an innocent man would have attempted to elaborate a little bit more, um, giving this same answer time and time again, suggested he had something to hide. The coincidences kept coming. DNA profiles of the victims found on dry land were on Wright's gloves, the blood of Paula Clonell and Annette Nichols was found on his reflective jacket, and fibres from Wright's home were connected to four of the five bodies. The fact is, there are no coincidences in this case, are there, Mr Wright? The fact is that you murdered each of these women. No, I did not. It was a pretty nervy trial. We'd been under pretty immense pressure, and as we'd got towards the end of the, uh, the, end of the trial, that, that pressure just increased. You know, the weight of expectation was pretty immense, as you can imagine. But in the end, the jury adjourned for just six hours before delivering its verdict. Guilty, the serial sex killer and his campaign of murder. At half past 12, the gates of Ipswich Crown Court slowly opened. Led by three police outriders, the prison van carrying Steve Wright emerged. From behind the barriers came shouts of abuse. Scum, one man screamed. An evil killer incarcerated forever. Wright was now officially a serial killer and branded as one of the most evil men in Britain. His father, finding it almost impossible to accept, wrote to him one last time to get the truth. Myself, I don't believe and can't even imagine how any one person could have carried out five murders in so short a time. And quite honestly, I don't think you could even kill a rabbit. I, I just don't think there's enough aggression in him 
If I had a rabbit in the garden, I said, I want, <coughs> can you go and wring its neck? He wouldn't be able to do it. Well, Steve, that's it from me now. If I get nothing from you, then I believe you are telling me something, something I'd rather not hear. In other words, if he's guilty, he, you know, I was thinking if he don't write, then he's telling me he's guilty. That was the way I wanted to put that across. You know, well, I, well I, he didn't write anyway. Wright's father may have found it hard to believe he was a multiple murderer, but others did not. And as more evidence about his past emerged, some were beginning to ask, had he killed even more? He went for us with a knife. He was so strong. He really was. He used to call himself the mean machine. Serial killer Steve Wright had been found guilty of the murders of five young women in Ipswich. But what made him do it? In the letter he sent to his father while on remand, he had talked of an unhappy childhood. But according to psychologists, a miserable past is no pointer to a violent future. It's all too easy to look to childhood events uh, as the cause of bizarre behaviours like this. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, they will not be a sufficient cause. Uh, most people have had unpleasant experiences in childhood, but they don't turn out to be serial killers. But other aspects of Wright's life do fit the profile of a multiple murderer. He demonstrated erratic behaviour, he drifted from job to job, and he'd been married twice. Serial killers very often have little to be proud of in their background. They have no career path, they have no stable relationships, they tend to be socially awkward, uh, perhaps uh, ordinary but uh, a bit unpopular. After leaving school with no qualifications, Wright was pot-washing for the Merchant Navy when he met his first wife and moved to Wales. By the age of 22, he was working as a steward aboard the QE2, where he was to meet his second wife. I first met Steve um, in 80, 1984. He used to inundate me with flowers and presents, and he, he was quite a charmer, really. Uh, he had a very possessive streak, though, very possessive, which I didn't like. When I went on QE, I'd been ashore once. I walked back to the ship with the shop manager, and when I got to the cabin, it had written on the cabin, slag, whore. I opened the cabin door, and he said, you like to wire you that much? There's your grass skirts. And he, he cut my skirts up into grass skirts, me uniforms. But then he went for us with a knife, and he, whether he went to hit me with it, I don't know, but it stuck in the door. He was so strong. He really was. He used to call himself the mean machine. Descriptions of uh, Wright's behaviour from uh, ex-partners and relatives suggest that he did have a tendency to rage, which would spring up quite unpredictably, and that would suggest uh, a lack of restraint, a lack of inhibitory processes that might uh, prevent most people from acting out dangerous sadistic fantasies. Wright also displayed another typical trait of serial killers. His murder methods showed he knew how to dispose of incriminating evidence without leaving a trace. What it suggested potentially was somebody who had uh, awareness of forensic uh, issues and had perhaps taken time to remove any potential uh, discovery of, of evidence um, by placing uh, their bodies in water. It clearly reduced the opportunity significantly for us by removing clothing that potentially uh, reduces the opportunity. The fact that we didn't find any clothing clearly reduced our opportunities. Wright sort of fits the profile of a serial killer in every respect except age. He was 48 at the time of the Ipswich killings, and that is uh, amazingly middle-aged uh, by the usual standards of serial killing, where usually they have uh, begun their activities perhaps um, mid to late 20s or early 30s at the latest. But had Wright really left it until his late 40s to begin killing, or had he started earlier? Those who have delved into his background point to patterns of behaviour, unsolved deaths and methods of murder, all of which suggest that the number of his victims may be even higher than the official tally. On leaving the QE2, Wright married Diane, and they managed a pub in Norwich. Just as he would do in Ipswich, Wright moved into the heart of the city's red light district. 
was frequented by sex workers, um, and he was known to many of, of, of those women. Um, it also emerged that uh, there were unsolved murder cases involving prostitutes, um, women who went missing, uh, and that obviously sent alarm bells ringing. The families of unsolved murder victims in East Anglia began asking questions about the so-called Suffolk Strangler. One of them was the father of murdered prostitute Michelle Bettles. Once Steve Wright had been arrested and obviously then more information was being released, at that point the wondering about was or could he have been involved in Michelle's death obviously became stronger because there was lots of connections you can put there. Tonight we start with the continuing search for the killer of a young woman who worked as a prostitute in Norwich. Michelle Bettle's body was found in Woodland on the outskirts of the city three weeks ago. She'd been strangled, she was only 22 and she had three young children. In 2002 Michelle travelled to work in Norwich's red light district not far from the ferry boat inn. Well, as far as you know, the last sighting was actually three days before Michelle was found. That is three days of her life that we've not got a clue where she was or what happened. Michelle had drifted into drugs, prostitution, and everything else. In all, four prostitutes have gone missing since 1992 in East Anglia. Mandy Duncan and Kelly Pratt have never been found. But the similarities between Michelle Bettles and Natalie Pierman's cases and those of the Ipswich Five are undeniable. Some of the clothing from the girls in Ipswich is missing. And in Michelle's case, there's clothing missing as well. You've then got the situations where all the girls were found, or most of the girls were found, with it being always in woodlands, uh, not too far from water. If Steve Wright is responsible for not only Michelle's death, but Natalie Pierman and the other girls as well, then he should be charged with that. And then their parents can actually turn around and say, it's over, sorry. We're looking at Steve Wright's lifetime timeline to look at his particular movements to see if, if, in, if in fact he may have been responsible for murder in the past, but at, but at this particular time, that, that remains just that speculation. Today in Ipswich, it's a different red light district to the one Steve Wright once terrorised. The authorities responded to the murders by declaring a zero tolerance policy towards curb crawling and street sex workers. There's still a hardcore, a very small hardcore of women who, who are determined to work the streets of Ipswich. But perhaps what's different now is they've got the right support mechanisms in place. It's incredibly difficult. This is not, the problem is not prostitution, it's, it's, it's drugs and the damage that that does, and that's where they need the support. Being treated like a normal person just feels really nice, just not to be looked at and criticised, you know what I mean? So that's just really helped, like, boost your confidence. But for the victims' families, the fact that the streets have been cleaned up is simply too late, and the fact that Wright still refuses to admit his guilt remains hard to accept. I wish we still had the death penalty, as this is what he truly deserves. He murdered five girls, but at the same time has ruined a lot more lives. At the end of the day, you've got to remember that every one of those prostitutes is someone's daughter, or a mother even. And people tend to forget that and realise you're not dealing with a story, you're dealing with people. This is for the families who have lost their daughters, including us. They can't take away our memories. They can't take away our love, our fortitude, our courage. I'll forgive her for any, anything that she's done. And my heart, my heart, sorry, go, goes out to these five. Victims. But there is also another victim, the father who never knew about his son's terrible secret. While Steve Wright spends the rest of his life in jail, he must serve his own unbearable sentence. Is he innocent? I don't know. Is he guilty? Everyone's telling me he is. But I just cannot see him capable of doing it. The thing is, the whole thing can never be put right.
And if there was a wish, Five, uh, five young girls had their life taken, and I'm told that my son <laughs> is responsible. So if I had a wish. It would be for that to be turned round and not to have happened.